In this lecture, we will introduce you to restorative practices. This is an approach that has its origins in ancestral community indigenous practices focused on improving communal living and strengthening affective bonds. We will see how restorative practices offer us tools to prevent, detect, manage and resolve conflict situations and disputes in different fields such as family, education, criminal justice and community. Restorative practices are a social science that studies how to generate social capital and achieve social discipline through learning focused on building effective bonds and decision-making based on participation. Social capital is defined as connections between people, trust and mutual understanding, shared values and behaviors that bind us together and make cooperative action possible. We can thus restore and achieve community building at a time in history when we are ironically able to establish communication rapidly and be connected thanks to technology and social networks while our lives are dissociated and isolated from our more immediate surroundings. These practices originated with restorative justice, which proposes a different way of understanding criminal justice in that its main focus is on repairing the damage done to people and relationships affected by crime rather than on the traditional function of punishing offenders. The first program for reconciliation, reparation and mediation between victims and offenders took place in Ontario in the 70s in collaboration with the probation department. This practice began to spread in the 90s with training of communities of support in Australia where the families of victims and offenders took part in collaborative processes called restorative practice meetings or circles. Since then, restorative practices have gradually spread to other Anglophone countries with few variations. Restorative justice is a response and life attitude for claiming the voice of victims and of the community in the process of administering justice. It puts the focus on the underlying problems and involves reintegration, acceptance and inclusion of both offender and the victim. The origins of these practices go back in times and are to be found in the collective ancestral meetings used by indigenous peoples centuries ago where circles were formed to create a space where people could feel safe and all voices could be heard. The practices are used not only as a reactive response for conflict management, they are also helpful in proactively preventing conflicts, improving communication and strengthening relationships and ties between community members and families, as well as professionals from seemingly very different fields such as education, criminal justice, social work, family groups and the community in general. The fundamental hypothesis of restorative practices is that human beings are happier, more cooperative and productive, and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. People are able to make positive changes when we count on them rather than we do things for them or to them. The idea of working together with people has huge implications. There is a greater likelihood that behaviors with negative consequences for the community are diminished more effectively this way than by relying on a system based on sanctions and punishments. The social discipline window illustrates this paradigm very clearly. It puts the focus on the interaction between two axes, the level of support, and encouragement that we offer to people and the level of control and responsibility that we demand. The hypothesis provides tools for community building through managing conflicts, improving relationships and strengthening effective ties. It is based on the indispensable values required for developing cooperative approach to dialogue and social and political inclusion community, shared responsibility, 
collective ownership, equality, restorative ties. Community building is essential. Community understood as creating relationships and ties and upholding them, fostering responsible participation and repairing relationships when things go wrong. If we devote 80% of the time to the activities that generate connections and ties between people, this strengthens the community in all aspects, not only by preventing conflictive situations from occurring, but also strengthening projects in its community and social cohesion. As this fosters participation, I thank responsibility. Therefore, less time will be devoted to specialized interventions because we will have fostered an environment favorable to good relations by reinforcing basic values such as equality among all members of the group, the opportunity to listen and be heard, safety and trust while we are feeling exposed and protected, shared responsibility in managing the conflict, collective ownership of the result, and restoring good relations by reestablishing effective ties. Bonds are crucial to building cohesive societies with a high capacity of self-management and the ability to act upon complex situations from within the community itself. Restorative principles are very important and they are included in all restorative practices. These are as follows. Everyone perceives things in a personal way, but all perceptions are equally valuable. Thoughts and emotions interact and affect our conduct. Living together in harmony requires being empathetic and considerate. It is important to understand who is affected and how by a specific action or situation. Identifying the needs of the parties involved helps to provide the strategies for satisfying them. Everyone must take on their own part of responsibility in a situation. Regardless of whether or not we are directly involved in a situation, we must take collective responsibility for what happened and for the consequences. There is a broad spectrum of restorative practices, ranging from more informal practices such as effective statements and restorative conversations, to more formal practices such as restorative circles, including dialogue circles. The formal practices enable and foster the development of social and emotional skills. They are helpful in mainstreaming the basic restorative principles and language, and they can be easily integrated in everyday life, thus building community. As practices get more formal, they become more structured, engage a greater number of people and require more time and planning. On the one hand, we have spontaneous effective statements along the lines of Rosenberg's nonviolent communication or empathetic communication. And on the other hand, we have restorative meetings or conferencing that require previous proceedings with all the people and parties involved in a conflict as they will be engaged in finding the best way to solve and repair the situation. Formal restorative processes may have a huge impact, but informal practices have a strong cumulative impact because they are part of everyday life and became a part of our behavior. Effective statements refer the way we communicate with individuals. Emotions are mechanisms that help us to react quickly when faced by unexpected events that occur automatically. They are an impulse to act. Everyone experiences emotions in a particular way, depending on their previous experiences, their learning background and their specific situation. All emotions are valid. They are basically energy. Our emotional reactions appear rapidly and unconsciously and we often don't know exactly where they're coming from. After our first reaction, 
we consciously analyze what's happening to us and then we start having conscious thoughts about the situation. The thoughts we have afterwards modify our initial emotion. So when our reaction is modified by our conscious thoughts, that's what we call feelings. They are neither good nor bad. They are simply a response to situations. When our needs are satisfied and covered, these generate positive expansive feelings of openness and connection. When they aren't, we have negative, isolating, isolating and destructive feelings. Actually, violence is the tragic expression of needs not satisfied. It is crucial, therefore, that we become familiar with our needs and learn to acknowledge them and express them so that we are able to ask for collaboration from other people. Empathetic communication creates the conditions for others to have access to our requests based on a desire for cooperation and not through fear, guilt, shame, obligation or desire for compensation. The purpose of empathetic communication is to create quality human connection where the needs of all the people involved matter and are satisfied based on a natural desire to contribute to the well-being of everybody. We have restorative conversations with individuals after there has been a conflict situation. These conversations where a people who has acted in a specific manner can reflect on their actions, express motivations and become conscious of the effects of their behavior on others. They also foster the search for alternatives to satisfy their needs as long as they are compatible with those of the others. The questions focus on the view of the situation their emotions, their thoughts, and the proposal for the future. We asked, what happened? What are you thinking of now? How do you feel? Who was affected by your behavior? In what way? What can you do to make this situation better? What do you need in order to do that? When we want to involve more people, we can use dialogue circles. They are basic practice for restorative dialogue and community building. We can set up different dialogue circles according to our objective. Once seated in a circle, we propose a simple exercise to make participants change places. That's next. We ask a starting question, an ice breaking, and then ask two or three questions on the subject that we want to deal with. We ask questions about the present, what is happening, about the future, how would you, would you like things to be, and about their engagement. What can you do to make things happen? And finally, a round of questions of closing and evaluation. In a dialogue circle, Everyone is seated in a circle and follows the basic rules that the facilitator has given. An object is passed among participants, the word object. So only the person holding the object can speak, and those who don't speak listen respectfully and await their turn. If someone doesn't wish to speak when the object reaches him, you can pass. Everyone takes part on equal terms so that participation is fostered, responsibilities are taken, relationships are built, empathy is fostered, self-confidence and trust is fostered, experiences are shared, and a space safe is created. The most formal form of restorative practices is the conferencing or restorative meeting. It consists of a well-structured and prepared meeting that is set up for voluntary participation of offenders, victims and the other people directly affected by and involved in a situation. 
These people have met previously with the facilitator who explains and shares all the information about the meeting procedures, the questions they will be asked, the people that will be taking part, and the objective, which is to agree upon the best way to repair the damage done and to establish relationships. As you have seen, restorative practices have a wide spectrum. We can use them with individuals and with groups. There are different practices in the range of restorative principles that improve and strengthen interpersonal bonds. When people's voices and feelings are taken into account and they feel supported by the community, they can get actively involved to assume the responsibility and consequences of their acts. They become key actors in managing and resolving their conflicts and building up a favorable atmosphere to strengthen fundamental shared values that will promote community cohesion and make life meaningful.